Welcome to Primary Prepcast. Hi, I'm Nadi. Hi, I'm Swapnil. And today we are going to discuss about diuretics. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So, fluid balance in ICU is notoriously difficult to assess. A positive fluid balance is associated with increased morbidity and mortality in ICU patients. A common treatment to remove excess fluid is through the use of diuretics. Could you please classify diuretics by their site of action and please briefly describe their mechanism of action? Diuretics are any agents that increase the volume of urine produced. However, the majority of diuretics are actually natriuretics and work by interfering with sodium reabsorption, thus causing increased renal sodium and thus ultimately increased water excretion. Diuretics can be classified by their site of action into four different categories. Those that act in the proximal tubule, the thick ascending loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting ducts. Proximal tubule diuretics include carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and osmotic diuretics. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors such as acetazolamide are weak diuretics and work by non-competitive inhibition of carbonic anhydrase. A large proportion of sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule is via a sodium hydrogen exchanger. This hydrogen ion combines with bicarbonate in the tubule and under the influence of carbonic anhydrase forms water and carbon dioxide, which can then be reabsorbed into the tubule cell. The water and the carbon dioxide then forms carbonic acid once again through the action of carbonic anhydrase, which then becomes hydrogen and bicarbonate. The bicarbonate is reabsorbed into the blood via a sodium bicarbonate co-transporter, while the hydrogen is used to reabsorb sodium from the tubule via the sodium hydrogen exchanger. Therefore, inhibition of carbonic anhydrase results in less carbonic acid formation and thus less sodium and bicarbonate reabsorption from the tubules. Whilst a large proportion of sodium and water are reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, acetazolamide is only a weak diuretic as there is significant compensation by the loop of Henle and distal tubules. The other proximal tubule diuretics are osmotic diuretics, such as mannitol, which are freely filtered at the glomerulus but are poorly reabsorbed. They increase the osmolarity of the ultrafiltrate and the tubular osmotic pressure, thus decreasing the reabsorption of water. This is particularly relevant in the proximal tubule, which is highly permeable to water and sodium and is responsible for about 60 to 70% of reabsorption of sodium. Thick ascending loop of Henle or loop diuretics such as fruizamide are the most potent diuretics and act by blocking the sodium potassium 2 chloride transporter, causing increased excretion of these ions. Distal convoluted tubule diuretics such as thiazide diuretics block the sodium chloride chloride transporter in the distal tubule, hence blocking the reabsorption of sodium and chloride. The final category are late distal tubule and collecting duct diuretics which include potassium-sparing diuretics, such as those that directly antagonize mineral, mineral corticoid receptors, such as brunolactone, and those that directly inhibit sodium influx through sodium-specific ion channels in the apical membrane, such as amylaride. Late distal tubule and collecting duct diuretics. These include potassium-sparing diuretics, such as those that directly antagonize mineral corticoid receptors, such as brunolactone, and those that inhibit sodium influx through sodium-specific ion channels in the apical membrane, such as amylaride. Aldosterone increases the expression of a sodium-specific ion channel, or ENAC, in the collecting ducts, as well as increasing the activity of the sodium-potassium ATPase pump on the basolateral membrane of the cell. This increases the reabsorption of sodium. Spironolactone is a competitive antagonist of aldosterone and therefore causes increased excretion of sodium. Amylaride directly inhibits this sodium channel, causing increased excretion of sodium. The other type of diuretic that works at the collecting ducts are direct antagonists of V2 receptors or VATANs. V2 receptors are G-protein coupled receptors in the collecting ducts, which, when activated by ADH, causes increased reabsorption of water from the tubules. 
Therefore, by blocking the V2 receptors, these drugs result in increased excretion of water or aquaresis. Okay, thank you. So let's discuss a clinical scenario now. A 75 year old male is admitted to intensive care unit with respiratory distress and hypoxemia, requiring the non invasive ventilation. A chest x ray shows feature of acute pulmonary edema and he's commenced on regular fresemide or Lasix. Could you please outline the mechanism of action of fresemide? So fresemide is a loop diuretic, that is, it acts on the thick ascending loop of Henle. The thick ascending loop of Henle is impermeable to water, but it has a sodium potassium chloride co-transporter, which reabsorbs one ion of sodium, one of potassium, and two ions of chloride into the interstitium. The thick ascending loop of Henle is responsible for its pro- approximately 25% of sodium reabsorption and 10% of bicarbonate reabsorption. Furosemide blocks the potassium um, sodium to chloride transporter, thus reducing the reabsorption of these ions. Normally, the potassium reabsorbed by this transporter is recycled back into the lumen. This causes a a positive electrical potential within the lumen, which drives the reabsorption of magnesium and calcium from the lumen and into the blood. By blocking this transporter, frizomide therefore also causes increased magnesium and calcium excretion. Blocking the sodium-potassium-2 chloride transporter results in diuresis for two reasons. It increases the amount of solute delivered to the distal parts of the nephron, which causes increased water excretion due to the osmotic effect. It disrupts the counter-current multiplier system by decreasing the reabsorption of these ions into the medullary interstitium, thereby decreasing the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid. This decreases the maximal concentrating ability of the kidneys as it decreases the reabsorption of water from the descending loop of Henle and the collecting ducts. Furosemide has also been shown to increase renal blood flow through its activation of cyclooxygenase 2, which produces prostaglandins. It has also been shown to have some beneficial effects on systemic vascular tone in heart failure by decreasing left ventricular filling pressure and reducing pulmonary edema prior to any observable diuretic action. Okay, could you please tell me more about the pharmacokinetics of furosemide? Sure, furosemide is a sulfonamide loop diuretic which is available in oral and IV formulations. It has an oral bioavailability of approximately 60% and has an onset of diuresis of 30 to 60 minutes after oral and just 5 minutes after IV administration. It enters the tubule mainly through secretion into the proximal tubule of the kidney. Its effects last six to eight hours after oral and two hours after IV administration. Furosemide is highly protein bound, about 90 to 99%, and crosses the placenta. It has minimal hepatic and renal metabolism with a half-life of about two hours in patients with normal renal function and is excreted in the urine, mostly as unchanged drug. Okay, a few days later, the blood tests revealed a potassium of 3.1 and bicarbonate of 32. What is the mechanism of action responsible for this side effect? And what are the other side effects that can furosemide cause? Furosemide blocks the sodium potassium 2 chloride transporter, causing increased delivery of sodium and potassium to the distal tubules. Increased distal tubular sodium concentration is one of the stimulants for increased um, sodium ion channel or ENAC expression, which causes more reabsorption of sodium and increased excretion of potassium and hydrogen ions. This can result in hypokalemia and a metabolic alkalosis. The hypokalemia can further compound the metabolic alkalosis as it causes hydrogen ions to shift intracellularly in exchange for potassium. The alkalosis is also increased if the patient is volume deplete as it results in increased aldosterone activation, which causes further increased excretion of potassium and hydrogen ions. Other biochemical abnormalities that can result are hypomagnesemia and hypocalcemia due to the loss of a positive electrical luminal potential in the thick ascending loop of Henle. 
Clinically, hypocalcemia is uncommon as calcium absorption can be increased through increased intestinal absorption and parathyroid hormone-induced renal reabsorption. But fruzomide can be a useful adjunct in situations of hypercalcemia when increased calcium excretion is required. Other than these biochemical abnormalities, fruzomide can also result in ototoxicity, especially in patients with impaired renal function. It can also result in hyperuricemia, hypervolemia, and allergic reactions. Okay. Another commonly used diuretic are thiazide diuretics, such as hydrochlorothiazide. Could you briefly describe its pharmacology? Hydrochlorothiazide is a thiazide diuretic and is only available orally, either as a single agent or as a fixed dose combination tablet with antihypertensive agents such as angiotensin receptor blockers. In terms of its pharmacodynamics, hydrochlorothiazide works by blocking the sodium chloride co-transporter in the distal convoluted tubule thereby reducing reabsorption of sodium and chloride, resulting in diuresis. Hydrochlorothiazide also causes some vasodilation and produces an antihypertensive effect by both its diuretic action and its effect on the vasculature. As their site of action is on the luminal membrane, hydrochlorothiazide must be secreted into the tubular lumen to be effective. Adverse effects of hydrochlorothiazide include biochemical abnormalities such as hypokalemia, hyponatremia, metabolic alkalosis, hypercalcemia, and hyperuricemia. The hypokalemia results, like in the case of loop diuretics, due to the increased distal delivery of sodium to the tubules, which which results in increased secretion of potassium in exchange for the sodium. Hyperuricemia is due to the fact that hydrochlorothiazide and uric acid are secreted into the renal tubules by the same mechanism, and this competition causes a reduction in uric acid excretion. Hypercalcemia results from decreased intracellular calcium, causing increased exchange of sodium and calcium at the basolateral membrane. Other adverse effects of hydrochlorothiazide include deranged metabolic parameters, including hyperlipidemia, increased triglycerides, and decreased glucose tolerance. As with all diuretics, Hydrochlorothiazide can also cause hypovolemia and allergic reactions. The pharmacokinetics of hydrochlorothiazide can be divided into its absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. In terms of its absorption, hydrochlorothiazide has 65 to 75 percent bioavailability, and the onset to diuresis is approximately two hours, with a peak effect in four to six hours. It is approximately 40 to 60% bound to proteins. It's not metabolized and is eliminated by um, the kidneys as an unchanged drug. The half-life is five to 14 hours, but is prolonged in patients with renal impairment. Okay, let's move on to another clinical scenario. A 58-year-old male with known cirrhosis, secondary to hepatitis C, is admitted to hospital with worsening ascites and peripheral edema. You notice that he is being prescribed spironolactone. Could you please outline the mechanism of action of spironolactone and its adverse effects? Spironolactone is a synthetic steroid which acts as a competitive antagonist of aldosterone. It is a potassium sparing diuretic which acts in the late distal tubules and early collecting ducts by competitively binding to the aldosterone receptors, thereby blocking the sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion that usually occurs. This causes increased excretion of sodium and water whilst potassium is retained. Liver cirrhosis is often associated with decreased effective circulatory volume causing activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and resulting in fluid retention. Spironolactone can provide an effective mechanism to counteract this secondary hyperaldosteronism. It is, however, a relatively weak diuretic as it primarily targets the late distal tubule and collecting ducts, where only a small proportion, approximately 1-2% to of sodium, is usually reabsorbed. Adverse effects of spironolactone include hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, gynecomastia and galacteria due to its antigen blocking effects. Okay, let's talk about less commonly used diuretic, acetazolamide, that is Dimox. Could you please tell me more about its 
pharmacokinetics and its other uses. Acetazolamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor which acts in the proximal tubule by blocking the production of hydrogen and bicarbonate from water and CO2 within the cell and thus reducing the absorption of sodium from the lumen in exchange for hydrogen from the cell. Acetazolamide is only a weak diuretic as downstream mechanisms usually compensate. However, it has several other indications. These include treatment of metabolic alkalosis, as it causes increased bicarbonate and decreased hydrogen excretion. It is sometimes used as a respiratory stimulant for patients with COPD and a metabolic alkalosis. It can also be used in glaucoma, as it causes decreased secretion of aqueous humor in the eye, resulting in a drop in intraocular pressure. Acetazolamide is often used as prophylaxis against and treatment of altitude sickness. The exact mechanism is unknown, but by causing a metabolic acidosis, acetazolamide is thought to increase minute ventilation and improve arterial oxygenation. Acetazolamide is sometimes used in refractory epilepsy. It inhibits carbonic anhydrase in the CNS, which seems to decrease epileptiform discharges, potentially due to increased intracellular carbon dioxide. Acetazolamide is available as a tablet, eye drop, and IV formulation. It has a very good oral bioavailability of over 95%, is highly protein bound and crosses the blood brain barrier. It is not metabolized, but is excreted unchanged in the urine and has a half life of three to nine hours. Thank you. That was a very comprehensive answer. So we are coming to the end of our podcast. I think hopefully the listeners will benefit from this comprehensive review of diuretics. So I have a question for you just to end the podcast. Oh, okay. Is it okay? I'm ready. What do you call an antidiuretic wine? Oh, antidiuretic wine. I know beer causes diuresis, but I'm not sure antidiuretic wine. Hmm. Pinot more. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. As usual, tricky question. Um. I hope uh, listeners you will benefit from this diuretic podcast and next time we will meet you with podcast on antihypertensive agents in intensive care unit till then and goodbye goodbye